very end of the part one, we saw this slide, which is reinforcing the thing we've, one of the things we've been talking about all semester, which is <laughs> that when you draw something, you draw selectively, and you draw with a purpose, and the purpose uh, can be uh, something you are proposing for the future. This is definitely the case in this example by Pugin, uh, who is making a point in the larger context of the debate. You may have been aware of this debate through uh, the history of architecture course you've taken, that uh, there was a big debate between whether what is the right style to design in? Um, is it the Gothic style or is it the classical style? And this was a big debate during the 19th century, and Pugin weighed in uh, forcefully on the side of the Gothic uh, because he was making a larger point about uh, a criticism of what was happening to the moral fiber of society under the influence of industrial, uh, of the Industrial Revolution. It was also a social commentary. He was saying, uh, when we have good Christian citizens in the Gothic city, uh, there is self-respect, there is mutual support, there is a community of, of people who are all helping each other in a good <coughs> Christian manner. When, when we get to uh, the industrial city of the later period, the factories start to take over the skyline. The pursuit of wealth takes over, uh, displaces the moral values of Christianity. And we end up with things like the prison. You can see the panopticon uh, pattern of the prison and the poorhouse. And the steeples are getting crowded out by the smokestacks. And there's a in general environmental degradation with the loss of, of the natural landscape. And so this is a very clear example of drawing with a purpose. Uh, this is also drawing with a purpose. This is um, uh, a political uh, illustrator uh, who often did political cartoons uh, in the 19th century. This is his uh, sharp criticism of the emerging conditions of the industrial city. The soot from the coal-burning steam locomotive and from the factories settles on everything in the city, including the wash lines, you put out your white linens and they come out black or gray. Uh, the, the density of the housing here is um, inhumane. And these are the backs of the uh, worker housing. Uh, the worker housing could not be located very far away from the factories themselves. And so people crowded into these quarters because they did not have cars to take them out to the lovely, pure countryside, they had to settle within walking distance. And so that's all part of uh, the industrial city. Uh, as the city industrialized, uh, we get more and more uh, concern about environmental degradation and social degradation. Uh, here's another one, um, the man with the whip. Uh, these, this is an oppressed population, if ever there was one. Um, so uh, this leads to a larger idea. Uh, you may have heard the name Edward Tufte. <coughs> if you've heard the name Edward Tufte, please raise your hand. Tufte. Um, who is Edward Tufte? He's the father of data visualization. Uh, actually, the term he used is information design. And the idea of information design is uh, there is meaning in data. Uh, but if the data is trapped in a spreadsheet, uh, the meanings are often lost. The meaning that data portrays, the, the meaning that data is able to convey is in part embedded in the data itself, but there's a big role to be played in how the data is presented. And that is another articulation of the big message of this class is that it matters how you show it. Have you, has anyone seen this visualization? This is one of Tufti's favorite visualizations. It shows um, the march uh, across um, Russia by Napoleon's army uh, on its way to Moscow. And 
the width of the line is a visualization of the troop strength. How many soldiers were there? And so at the beginning, with great confidence, one, one battalion shoots off and heads to another city. This battalion shoots off and, and heads to a, a second city. And the rest march for Moscow. But something is going horribly, terribly wrong here. Uh, are they encountering resistance? Yes. But the, the bigger message is told when you compare the troop strength to the temperature. This is a, uh, an uncharacteristically cold winter. Um, and so the, uh, the march is plagued by the problems of cold temperatures, especially on the long march home. And so if they leave home with this many troops, they arrive in Moscow uh, severely depleted, and then uh, people just die off. Soldiers die off uh, on the march home. So you could convey this information in a spreadsheet, but the meaning of the information is likely to be lost. The same is true with a lot of the information that we do in we convey with drawing. The meanings uh, are extremely dependent on the manner of your uh, representation of those meanings. And so drawing matters. Um, drawing is a, is a crucial part of the whole thing. For example, you may have heard of cholera. It was one of the biggest problems of the industrial city in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, when the cholera, I mentioned it last time, when uh, cholera hit a city, it killed tens of thousands of people, not just poor people, but wealthy people as well, because poor people worked in the homes of the wealthy, and it, it was quickly spread. And what everyone knew to be the case was that if you could smell something bad, you were being exposed to disease. This turned out not to be true, but it is what drove a great deal of the urban form. Uh, it was all about bringing light into housing and to allow air to circulate so that these smells would be reduced, uh, so that uh, this, the homes could be ventilated and filled with light and they would be less prone to mold, mildew, and bad smells, and thus the spread of disease. Uh, so when these epidemics hit, it was, a, it was considered to be a, a problem of light and air, and so housing strategies were changed, and we're going to get to a few of those housing strategies. But this is an example of an extremely powerful data visualization in which um, a young doctor by the name of John Snow in London uh, made a graphic representation of who was dying and where they lived when they were dying. And it yielded a map uh, such as this. This is a reproduction of the actual map. Uh, what didn't look exactly like this, but this is an area of downtown London, <clears throat> and the black squares are the deaths uh, of cholera. Now you'll see here um, another element, which is the wells. Uh, throughout here are different wells. And what was determined because of this map, it was determined that your likelihood of dying depended a great deal on how close you lived to this water source. And so based on this data visualization, Snow came up with another theory uh, to counter the theory that it was light and air, he came up with the theory that it was the water. And sure enough, we have confirmed that cholera is spread through the water supply, um, confirming rule number one, which is, of course, do you remember rule number one in urban planning? Don't shit where you eat. Yes, thank you. Um, and so uh, this brings us to the writings of uh, young Friedrich Engels, uh, which is the reading for next week, <clears throat> he, in which he um, uh, is exposed to the conditions of the industrial city and leaves uh, with a theory of, of socialism um, that comes out of his... It's really the whole idea of socialism as, uh, as penned by... Uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels really comes out of an urban condition and an analysis of the urban condition 
Engels observes that the main shopping streets of London uh, look to be quite nice. Uh, the red zones are the wealthier retail establishments with high quality housing above. Um, uh, so the, the bigger the street, the more likely the housing quality is high. And then it's, but it's in the back alleys uh, of the inner blocks where the conditions really deteriorate. Uh, the wealthy merchants traveling in and out of town to get to their factories or to shop uh, experience the city in a very positive way. But, in, but buried in the inner blocks is the truth about the city, which is the truth that uh, Engels writes about in his uh, Great Towns uh, essay uh, that you will be reading. And so this is the, that's the uh, verbal description that goes with this visual analysis. Um, this is uh, a problem to the very present, the issue of housing conditions. Um, the grid of lower Manhattan uh, started out to be a mosaic of grid patterns until it was uh, regular, regularized by the, uh, the, the uh, plan of 1811. Uh, and you get the um, quite remarkably uh, anticipation of the development of the island of Manhattan far beyond any reasonable expectation of economic development. Uh, in part, it anticipated something that was inevitable, but there was also an element of it made it happen. Uh, the value of land here was very low, but closer to Wall Street, uh, the value of land was very high. And the fact that every parcel on this grid was basically the same footprint of 25 feet wide by 100 feet deep. It allowed uh, people to consider the purchase and design of the housing for any block in Manhattan because every piece of land was more or less the same configuration of every other piece of land. Only the price would change depending on how far north you went uh, on the island of Manhattan. Um, in the lower part of Manhattan, uh, this is where all the economic activity was because of the port uh, and because of factories. And so you've got an extreme concentration of humanity in these places. These cots would be rented by the hour um, just to get some sleep between factory shifts. Uh, the streets became very clogged. The tenement apartments uh, were both a place to live uh, and uh, places of work. And so uh, they would sleep in shifts, and piecework would be done uh, in the same space. Um, piecework is where you'd get, um, you know, one cent for every 20 little flowers, uh, decorative flowers used in, <coughs> in the dress industry down the, down the block. Um, you'd get a penny for every 20 flowers that you folded and, and crafted. Uh, and this is the piecework happening in one of those apartments. You would do it by the window. The windows were rare. And actually, this entire neighborhood uh, still bears the mark uh, of that housing type. And then later, housing reform uh, models and designs that, that came and displaced those things. Now, the remedy for the uh, industrial city was the garden city. Ebenezer Howard, again, uh, transformed this business without ever going to architecture school. He was uh, just an amateur, and he made the point that uh, we all want to live in the town because that's where the economic activity is. But we also want to live in the country because that's where the uh, pleasant environment is. And so he said, let's take the best of both worlds. And he really, this is the idea that really, um, he codified it in a way, it had, it had actually always existed, at least since Rome and probably before, that you want to have the right balance between these two elements. Uh, but he articulated in a way uh, in his writings about the Garden City that really captured uh, people's imagination and really uh, it had a big impact um, on everything that followed. So 
when he talks about the Garden City, when you look back at this, he, he really was talking about a city. It was actually a very high uh, population density, very closely compacted around these transportation nodes with open space in between for agriculture and large institutions. Um, and the main population densities were at these nodes gathered around the central city. And so it was very much a linkage between transportation and land use uh, in a way that since then his ideas have become uh, applied to suburban situations, but it's worth noting that his original conception was not at all suburban. Um, it really was uh, had boulevards and trains and high density. Um, this is a reference back to um, Hadrian's villa, which again was a was a suburban idea of getting the, boast, the best of both worlds. Uh, it was set in the countryside, but it was also linked to the city. It was an oasis of culture, and it was uh, organized in relationship to the landscape in order to maintain a certain set of relationships, whereas the urban grid uh, obliterated the landscape to a large extent. And through the Renaissance, uh, this, this relationship was highly prized. Uh, through the works of Palladio in the villas, uh, through the English garden design, this is very much uh, in keeping with the city as an organism idea. Um, the works of Andrew Jackson Downing uh, during the 19th century to create picturesque homes set in the landscape as if it was in the woods, but more often than not, it was aligned along a suburban street. Um, here is uh, an effort uh, to <coughs> interpret the Garden City, the ideas of Ebenezer Howard, to the situation in England, where instead of allowing cities to sprawl without limitation, the idea was to inject a green belt uh, around the city of London and to restrict the boundaries, to bound, to actually put a belt around, tighten a belt around London so it couldn't continue to expand. Um, and so there were a series of cities built out on the, beyond the green belt that was very much um, uh, a manifestation of the uh, Garden City ideas. This turns out to be uh, an important uh, set of principles embedded in the, the evolution of housing uh, design. Um, uh, this in, in New York. The 25-foot-wide, uh, the 100-foot-deep lot was originally <coughs> settled uh, when buildings that were like this, uh, with windows on the front and back, and the depth of the building was limited by the fact that you did need light and air to every space. This building allowed bedrooms to exist on the inside of the building, and since these buildings are one next to each other, the only exposure is on the very front and the back. And so these bedrooms had no windows, and a law was passed uh, after 1850 um, well, after 1850, uh, that practice was extended to even longer buildings, making these inner bedrooms even less, giving them less access to light. But then, uh, starting in 1879, uh, the laws start to evolve, or the practice starts to evolve, such that these, these are light shafts, air shafts, that allow air to circulate vertically through the five-story building and uh, give some air to these windows, allows you to put windows at least on these inner rooms here, um, and sometimes very small. This became the dominant pattern of much of lower Manhattan with this after, 19, after 1887, uh, so that this was the air shaft design. And so much of the fabric of lower Manhattan is this type of housing, which requires a window in every room uh, of the building, and this is in a way a model of the maximum housing density where there's still a window in every room. After 1900, it shifted to favoring 50-foot wide lots um, and larger air shafts. So this had a, a big effect on what followed. And so we start to see blocks uh, after the 18, in the, into the 1890s like this with the air shafts. 
and very narrow alleys in the back. Uh, to, as the laws evolve, the amount of openness in these blocks increased steadily. And uh, into the 20th century, their architects became extremely interested in the ideas of increasing the height as a way of increasing the open space. And so you get um, maximum lot coverage. And so you have to keep a certain percentage of every lot open. Uh, and so you start to get schemes like this, where it, the, the middle opens up more and more. And um, this is uh, into the, to the 20th century. They start to open up the inner block. Architects become very interested in housing schemes that give everybody these private yards, but then there becomes a collective space in the middle of the block. And this becomes one of the more interesting evolutions of the Garden City idea, where you start to experiment with high population densities, um, but increasing the open space of the block. And so you get these housing types that are responding to the fact that there, is, uh, there are two fronts. There's a front on the street side, and there's a front on the, on the block side, the inner, inner block side. And so in Queens, New York, you get the development of Sunnyside Gardens, uh, which is one of the pioneering efforts to create this type of experience in your housing uh, situation, uh, where it's a collectively owned uh, central block. And then we move towards what really is the high point of this. Uh, unfortunately, it was 1929, and we really haven't developed much beyond that high point in Radburn, New Jersey where, um, well, this is still pre-Radburn, but we start to get the idea of fractal geometries, where increasing, maximizing the surface area of, of a form. And so these blocks, uh, the surface area that is accessible by the car, because the car is becoming an increasingly big issue. So you maximize the surface area on the outside where the car makes access to these houses. And at the same time, you maximize the surface area of the access to uh, the pedestrian realm in the middle of the block. And so you get the car realm and the pedestrian realm. If you just do it in a flat geometry, you don't, you don't get a lot of housing out of it. But if you go fractal, uh, all of a sudden, the, the space that you get between those two worlds, those two separate networks, increases dramatically. Uh, and as the car becomes a bigger, bigger issue in terms of environmental uh, quality, um, this becomes an increasingly important issue. This is a graph of um, economic depression uh, and building activity uh, also involving car ownership. This is an early and very effective uh, data visualization. So Clarence Stein, around the this time in the teens and 20s between the wars, um, starts to develop ideas of the neighborhood unit, saying that the, the, ideal, the ideal structure of a town, of a healthy town, is you keep the traffic and the business outside, and so you have these retail centers, and at the center, you put the schools so the children uh, are safe from the traffic and the business <coughs> of the outer edge, and then you fill the rest with housing. And you keep the whole thing within easy walking distance of about a radius of one mile. And so they're dealing with the scale of the human body. What is the scale that works for walking? And so um, this idea was, was applied to uh, Radburn, New Jersey, along with this idea of the inner block being a pedestrian realm and the outer block being the automobile realm. And so you get things like this, where every house has two fronts. You have houses with, with car fronts and houses with pedestrian fronts. And the, so every house is organized to have one orientation towards the car world of the city and another orientation to the pedestrian world of the country. And it really is the result of this diagram of the intertwined fingers. And it does a magical thing. It allows the children to walk to school 
without ever crossing a street because they put underground underpasses. And so the children are free-range children. How many people grew up as free-range children? Um, it's increasingly rare um, to have uh, children free-range. Even as crime decreases, uh, our fears increase, and the environment is less conducive um, and so, as we have fewer and fewer places like this. Although this idea is making a comeback, and many people are seeing, um, seeing ways to inject this into new housing situations. This is a case where a student in this course identified the location of that map as it was built and then added it to the, the actual fabric as constructed and showing how the orange pedestrian walkways link every house to the local school which becomes the community center. And um, uh, other views emphasize how this diagram was applied in a limited way. And then after World War II, a different pattern became dominant, which did not have that. Everybody has their own private backyard. It is completely disconnected from everybody else's private backyard. And so there is no network through the back. And so which place would you rather live? Would you rather live? where there is an interconnected world behind your house, or whether there is uh, closed off privacy. So I think that's it. There are other examples. These are some, some excellent analysis examples, by the way. Thank you.